A big shout out goes to Maxis Tires, Jensen USA, and Fox Shocks for supporting the Inside Line. Welcome mountain bikers. We have a compelling Inside Line today with photographer and friend of Vital, Jack Rice. If you're looking for the mountain bike and photo discussion, you'll have to go in about an hour because prior to that, we discuss how Jack got to where he is today. There's some pretty heavy topics and subjects discussed that may be a bit much for younger listeners or sensitive ears, so please be aware of that. I put chapter marks in the description, but I hope you listen to the whole show because Jack has a pretty incredible story to tell, and I can only imagine how difficult it was for him to share it. But it's the people that make mountain biking so awesome. And that includes all of you listeners out there. Thanks so much for being part of the community on Vital. And Jackie Rice Cakes, thanks for your candor. Love you, bud. Enjoy the show. If I bring anything up that you don't want to talk about, just say so, and we don't have to go deeper, and I'll segue, like yep. I'll transition it. And then after the fact, if there's something you don't want to have in there, let me know too. Thank so, you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Sweet. First of all, stoked to have you on. Just want to say thank you for, for all the hard work that you've done this season out on the circuit, you know, domestically and on the World Cup. So appreciate the hustle out there. You've definitely been a hustler, to say the least. So thank you for that. Thanks for having me, man. I mean, without without you, without Vital, I would not uh, have been around the world in, you know, two years going to Europe and and there's just so much to like say that I've had stuff that I've wanted to say and like now that we're here it's just all out the window like I have <laughs> I, it's 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 crazy man it's like going to the grocery store and like you know you're supposed to write your list and then you get there and you're totally blank like I'm so I'm so grateful like <laughs> yeah just so grateful and and cool and humble and yeah just just happy to be here awesome well we'll give you time to say whatever you need to say so no worry about that yeah it's been fun to watch you progress over the years and especially as you get to know more people you know can see the relationships build and there's trust there and yeah. you know that that's it's just awesome to see through your work and so thanks for what you've done out there and stoked to see you grow go and grow more and I'm stoked to dig into your story and learn more about you and learn from you because you know like I mentioned on the in text the other day like bikes and cameras are kind of boring but humans aren't and so I'm I'm stoked to stoked to learn more about you and learn from you so same man I mean I feel like you know our our communication has been strictly digital and <laughs> yeah it, and in a way it's i think that's worked to our advantage it, like it's mm -hmm. made it not so personal so there there leaves some some intrigue like 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 i'm always thinking like uh i wonder if spomer's like mad today you know like or like <laughs> i wonder if i wonder what he's doing when he gets this like is he eating his breakfast or is he yeah. uh taking his kids to school or is he, you know did you know, and through the years, there's just been so many like times where I'm like, what, what is Spomer doing now? Especially being in <laughs> Europe, it's like, what is he going to think? And then sometimes forgetting like, oh, I'm in Europe and he's like, you're doing something completely different or yeah. like totally asleep or whatever. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's cool to, to sit down and talk. I I don't think we've ever really done anything like this. Do we have it in a non in an, in a non official capacity? I was trying to think. Did we meet in twenty eighteen or nineteen? Do you remember at Windrock? Twenty seventeen. Was it? It was it, that long ago. It okay. Actually, you know what? I have all that stuff right here. I think okay. okay sweet. So twenty. If I just go to this photo with me and Kathy Sessler. Okay. Yep. 2018, March 11th, okay. 2018. Me and, uh, Kathy Sessler. That's, <laughs> That's <hilarious. awesome. laughs> Well, one, I didn't remember the, the year, but I kind of don't remember a ton other than I think we were like at the finish line area and Close. you just, you just walked up and introduced yourself, right? Yep. Well, I was just going to say that it's 
I don't know, it just seemed pretty providential. Like I didn't go to races. I think that was the first race I'd been to in a long time, as far as like traveling, like more than driving. And so yeah. to be there and then to meet you and have you come up to me, like, it's just, you know, just seems like it was meant to be like, I don't think things like that are, you know, by accident. And so it's, no. you know, it's pretty cool to think back about, I think five years ago, what it was like then. And then I, why were you there? Were you there to take pictures? Like you weren't racing, right? Nope, not at all. So right. I went with uh, my friend uh, Jackson Kenny, who lives about an hour north of me, uh, and he was racing. And it was the first time that, like, Menar and Danny and all those guys were going to be at Winrock and yeah. by proxy in the U.S. So we were. I was like, dude you're going to race this race and we're going to go see what downhill is like. Because before <laughs> that, all, all I knew was, uh, mountain biking in Maine, uh, just seeing one or two local races before that, that he had participated in. And it was just, it was just to see if I could go and be up to speed and race. Hmm. That was the whole, the whole thing. And I was young enough, I guess, back then, to do it at a at a just like as a recreational thing and it uh bikes have been like a big part of me uh kind of taking my um it's been it's been very therapeutic for me so uh the further i got into it the more i like it's funny man I, it's so hard to tell these these stories so before this seven years ago i uh i lived a completely different life um I'm not going to, we can kind of go back to it if you want, but, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, I was a criminal and one day, uh, I don't know why, what was different on this day. I just decided no more. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, the town and family and friends really rallied behind me and, and helped, um, a lot of stuff happened to get to there, but. Uh, basically I needed a bike to get to and from my first job. And, uh, so I bought a Cannondale hardtail mm. and, um, I loved it. It was like, if I couldn't sleep it, this first couple, the first year of, of living that new life is very tough. And like at night I would get like just restless leg syndrome. So I would get on the bike at like 10 at night and just blaze through this. I live in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. So I would just blaze through Booth Bay, just, just, you know, trudging up the hills, just trying to get all the energy out of my legs. Mm. And then I would go to where I was living at the time and lay down and just knock right out. So it was perfect. It got me to work and it, it provided me something else to do because I came up skateboarding, tore my ACL. I can't skate anymore to any, anything looking good so um yeah one day i uh, something broke or i needed to change a derailleur and i actually turned on uh, a gmbn video <laughs> to like fix it fix the problem yeah but then by by just looking through the youtube and seeing all the downhill i was like oh yeah i remember being like sick and like staying home from school and seeing like Palmer on the X Games, like I was like, oh, I, really? I used to love that guy. Oh yeah, yeah. There was a I I was super into it for a good like year or two of my my youth, just watching it. I knew I could never like do it or afford it at that time, but um yeah, so and then by and then I saw Vital Raw videos. So once I saw those and I was like, oh, I want to do this. This is, <laughs> That's awesome. this is what I want to do. And this is what fires me up. Huh. And, uh, shortly after that, the podcast started coming out. Okay. So I was a super big fan of that. And, uh, I heard you talking in the woods. I didn't even see you when we were down in Winrock. I just heard your voice and I was <laughs> right? like, I know that voice. Yeah. So when I came up to you, I, I was assuming you were Sean Spomer, but I, I had no idea. So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And you, and you were with, you. I don't know if you were with Lars or, or somebody, 
but you were like taking shots like near the waterfall or something and uh okay. and uh yeah i just knew i was like if i don't talk to him now i'm, not, I'm never going to talk to him even just to tell you know that i'm a fan and all this stuff and then i was like i don't know what what the conniption in me was but uh, <laughs> i remember saying like hey if you ever need anything let me know yeah. and then you were like yeah give me a line and that was the best and worst thing you could have ever said because <laughs> i think i i bothered you for quite a few months after that and then uh yeah it was, yeah and here we are yeah <laughs> Did did we talk down near the finish line though? Maybe like a second time. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. I then think I, maybe I, I think, remember yeah, I th the first time then up there. I think uh, is it Kill Murray? Like he's working with Danny and stuff. I don't know. I, yep. I think I remember the the first time that yeah you came on like trackside and we met. So. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it was trackside, and then like yeah, <laughs> like you said, the next day I think. It was just like, just because we had just met, we just said, what's up or whatever. And I was like, I just knew, I, I knew something was up. I, I had a feeling, I was like, this guy's, something's going to happen here. Huh. And and even like the whole ride home, I was like, I wonder if I could like work for Vital, like on the, on the uh, computer side of things, mm -hmm. knowing nothing about computers. I don't know what I was thinking about at, or <laughs> thought I could do but uh that was my original plan was to work on vital work for vital on the back end yeah like never, posting stuff right yeah photography yeah. was never in the uh in the I always thought it was cool but I just never had the equipment or or thought to do it you know yeah so All right. um but that's a funny story in itself so I I when you you had called me up to do, I think my first, it was uh, U.S. Open. First time Dakota was wearing that jersey. <laughs> and uh, um, I was coaching lacrosse at the time, and I didn't have a camera. But one of the, the, the kids' moms had a like a rebel, and she was like, I'll let you use this. And I was like, perfect, that's all I need. <laughs> and then I... And then I had like two days before the race to just YouTube everything like mm. man, because you were like, you should try to shoot in manual. So I I did that and, and got all my what I thought was good at the time. And I was like, all right, good to go. And then uh, <laughs> off I went. And I really I really didn't expect much. I thought if anything, it would be a good like practice run or like something like that. But you, you published it. You, mm. you put it out. But that was my first Pippets. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what surprised me at Windrock is that, you know, you just came up and started talking. And I'm not like that at all. Like, I I shy away from people. I go hide in the woods and take pictures and all that. So, just yeah. the fact that you were like that and you kept pushing on it, I'm like, hey, here we are. I could tell you had some, some grit and some, you know, determination and some drive. And yeah. Let's Man, go. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I kind of, I pride, I pride myself on, on my work ethic and that kind of hustler spirit, um, has always, yeah, been a driving force for me for good or for bad. So yeah. Yeah. Did you get that bike at a shop? Did you, or did you buy it used? Like, do you remember the Cannondale? The Cannondale where I get it. <laughs> um, I don't remember. I, oh yeah, we did go to a shop. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the shop. That's bad. Oh no, it was my local bike shop. Okay. It was. It was. Yep. Cool. Uh bat or bath ski and cycle. Best best bike shop in Maine, baby. <laughs> honestly, funny. honestly it is. It is pro it is the best best bike shop in Maine. Bath ski and cycle bath ski and cycle in Woolwich, Maine. Shout out. All right, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Are you able to talk about some of your pre-bike history at all and like just yep. kind of getting everything because yep. you know what show us show us your fists brooklyn baby brooklyn's yep. not at, brooklyn's not in maine no um so all right so i grew up in new york new york city um uh brooklyn to be exact but i was born in the city i was born in uh lennox hill hospital 
in Midtown. Um, and then I grew up uh, most of my life in Brooklyn, or uh, half of it there, and, and the rest uh, 30 minutes north of like the Bronx in a town or a small city called Peekskill, New York. Uh, yeah, so like growing up in the city, you get, I, I, f I feel like I was very fortunate to do that, to have been grown up at, at the time and place I did. I mean, it was, it was just cool. Like I thought I watched Sesame Street and I thought it was like right down the street. Like I, <laughs> I, I was, it was just, it was so, such an awesome time to be in, in the city and, and, um, experience that. I mean, I, to me, it was normal. I'd go to like my, so my, my dad's family's all New York, all Brooklyn. My mom's family's all Massachusetts and Maine. Okay. Um, that was later by marriage, the main main part of it. But every summer, since I was 18 months old, I think, I've been coming up here to our summer house, which is 10 minutes down the road from me. And, um, and yeah, so I'd come here every summer. So I'd get to see, like, the both the kind of the two worlds of like living or going to school where like you're one of the few white kids to like be in the being in New England I mean say I don't really have to say anymore but I got to I got to see how different cultures and and people of different ethnicities and and all sorts of backgrounds just kind of like living together in 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 this city and and it's normal and it's it's all it's all I knew you know mm -hmm. so um uh I was I was not I wasn't it's kind of hard to like I wasn't the bad kid in school but I was the the clown you know like I always tried to get a laugh or or get attention somehow um and uh, I found out that I could do that with first through um, sports, uh, like played Pop Warner football in third grade. I was the smallest kid on the team. Hmm. So my coach put me at defensive center so that I could crawl under the guys. And then he said, just grab the quarterback's ankles and he'll fall eventually. <laughs> so that was my job. That's all I did. Okay. And they loved me. I'd come off and everyone would be going crazy because I was significantly smaller than any of the other kids. I just was a late bloomer. Yeah. But uh And that didn't scare uh, you or anything, like being smaller? Oh no, I was terrified, dude. Okay. I was terrified. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely terrified. Okay. I I think once I peed my pants before the game <laughs> and and the grass was wet, so my mom said she was like, Go just roll around and nobody will notice. I was like, Okay. And uh, nobody did. But. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, I was always scared, man. I was, always, I, I lived very. I mean, you grow up in in New York in a Roman Catholic household, and uh, you know, it, that's another thing. Like, I went to, I was never in like a school system long enough to really, uh. Like some, I know like some people go to the same school district their whole life. Like I could never put together more than three years in a school. Like it was either we were moving or, um, uh, later in high school, I got like a athletic scholarship to go to a private high school. And I just wanted to go there cause I knew all the pretty girls were there and had to, you know, uh, had a dress code that I agreed with. So um, I wanted to go to that school and I actually failed the test to get into the school, but because I was playing varsity lacrosse and varsity football as a eighth grader, then they just, hmm. you know, threw me in. So I went to this uh, high school, John, uh, JFK high school, played lacrosse and football. I did really well in lacrosse. I played attack and, um, goalie and uh yeah i was i was for my grade and and age i was a lot better than most hmm. i don't want to like toot my own horn but i picked it up oh, yeah. pretty quick 
Yeah. So were you um, still that was my... were you still smaller at that time, or were you kind of? Nah, I, okay. I grew. I grew. Yep. Yeah, I I got bigger, and I was always skinny. I mean, I'm still. I've always been a skinny kid, but I figured. I figured out in football that if I ran a little bit faster and if I put my head down a little bit sooner, that I could lay people out. And once I started doing that, I was having way more fun. So, (laughs) yeah. So where to go from JFK then? Um, So JFK was a very, it was a private school. Um, And uh, I should probably preface this by saying, um, in middle school, I went to a public middle school where I met my, like, what I would, didn't know at the time, but would, would be my, like, core group of friends I met in middle school in eighth grade uh, when 9-11 happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, were you in Brooklyn during 9-11? No, no. Okay. We had, we had already moved, but okay. we could still see the, this 9-11 had a big impact on, I think, or, or through therapy, we, we know, like, um, really impacted me. Mm-hmm. Um, um, that's when I had my first beer. That's when I had, like, I can remember we went up to, uh, the top of the hill in um, this park, Hillcrest Park. And, uh, from there you could see the city and, and it was just smoke, just sm- like the smoke had enveloped the city. Mm-hmm. And, uh, at that point, I still hadn't heard from my dad, and he was working in uh, the Supreme uh, Supreme Court, so down on Court Street. And he, I found this out later, he had four friends at a meeting at the World Trade Center. So he immediately, he's a Vietnam veteran and all this stuff, so his his inclination was to run towards the buildings he thought that he would turn a stone over and find them, and it just it never happened. Yeah. But um, you know that worry, like we didn't hear from him. I think until like the next day, or like really, really late at night, like because all the phones were out, all yeah. the you know all, all that stuff. So um, yeah, that, and uh, a lot of my friends' parents didn't come home. Um, oh, my hockey man. coach at the time who was like Superman to me, uh, Sam Otis. He, uh, he was one of the firefighters that was like, I think they were the first or second, um, in to the first building. And, uh, he never made it out. So like in my, uh, 13 year old brain, you know, it was like, here's this guy that's Superman. Like he was, he was jacked. Like he, he was a good coach. He never like yelled at us too badly or anything, but like when he said something, you did it. And, uh, yeah, just the fact that when they, I had already been to a bunch of funerals. I was an altar server. So I had like 200 funerals under my belt at that point. I know this is all, you're probably seeing how this is going, but, um, I had seen caskets come down that aisle at in all sh- you know shapes and sizes, including small ones, which are very tough. Uh, but when they just walked down the aisle holding his helmet, it kind of just showed like the sheer volume of like, and it wasn't his helmet, you know, it was uh, just a replica. Of it. Um, yeah, it it uh it made me realize that like everything could just be gone within a blink of an eye, you know? So, um, yeah, that affected me Dude, for sure. You're 13. Yeah, yeah. 13. I was, a, I was already, yeah. Like I said, you know, jumping from school to school, I was in a Catholic school at that time. So if you were an altar ser- server, you got to get out of class. So that's why I did it. Cause I was like, yeah, I want to get out of class. And, uh, but I went to a lot of funerals and a lot of weddings before I think it's appropriate to, uh, really do that, you know? Hmm. So, gosh, um, bud. never, never got the, like, uh, the priest part of it. Thank God. I know some, some people that did, but, um, Oh, like, like abuse stuff. Yeah. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like diddle 
kind of stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it was gnarly, and not and when that all broke, like my mom never came to church, but my dad always like made us go to church. Like that was every Sunday without fail. If if he was busy, he'd send me with my neighbor, and she'd make us sit front row. Like it was. And it wasn't my thing. It wasn't anything. It was just like, oh, here we go. I got to go to, you know, I can't stay out and skate because I got to go to church Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But, um, yeah. Oh, that's such a massive trauma and tragedy for for being that age for everyone in the country, for sure. But, like, you're so close to home, like people you knew. Oh, Oh, man. Yeah, I remember my my Spanish teacher just, just bawling. Because what they had done was, we could see like the, on my my second period, we could see the jets like flying on the Hudson River, like we had a beautiful view of the Hudson from science class. And uh, we saw all these jets like scrambling, like flying super low. And, and uh, mm. you know, as kids we were like, oh, cool. Like they're doing some, some cool shit for once. And... Uh, and then the next period, they uh, put us in, um, we had to go to gym. So it's, you know, boys on one side, girls on the other. And to his credit, our, our gym teacher, he must have been 20, 21. He had to tell, uh, you know, 30 eighth graders about planes flying into the World Trade Center where most of our parents worked. And yeah, Gosh. in in his defense, you know, he he teared up towards the end because he said, I'm, you know, sorry to s- s- tell you, but some of you might not have, you know, he he like worded it. Well, he said, you know, some of you might not have like contact with your folks when you go home. He said, so like expect that. So I think to his credit, he kind of like prepped us for the worse and it was the worst jeez dude yeah sorry it sucked yeah how'd you i mean i feel i feel more bad for my dad and and for all the people that really lost someone directly you know i i watched it and it was it was just horrible yeah just horrible to see just the pain and I mean, with with everything going on in the world right now i mean my i'm kind of spiked you know yeah How'd you move on? Like how, like I can't imagine how you even go on from that being so close to it all. I think we, I mean, there was, there was this sense of camaraderie and, and this sense of, you know, New York strong, like uh, we're, we already knew we were the toughest people in the country and, and now to get through that, that solidified it, you know, um, I think I buried myself in sports. Like I said, I played, uh, varsity lacrosse as an eighth grader. So playing against high schoolers and, and all that was extremely like demanding and scared. I was scared, you know, terrified every time I stepped out on the field, but the better I got, the more the, the fear kind of dissipated and I was able to overcome it. And then I had going to that school was a really a big shift, like going from a, a public school in Peekskill and then going. It was like a 40 minute bus ride north, like towards the uh, state line with Connecticut. And um, so it was out in the boonies and. And it was, you know, kids from all Putnam and Westchester County, New York. So you had kids from all over and uh, it was just cool. It was just cool to like be out of my town or that town and to kind of be, it was almost like a fresh start. Like nobody Mm -hmm. knew each other. So we had a um, kind of like a chance to start over. Mm -hmm. So. I played football and nobody knew me and uh, they had never, the town I was in was called Somers in New York and they couldn't beat 
this town, this, that school and any sport for like, it was like five or seven years. Like they were this, the, that Somers was just such a powerhouse and everything. So, uh, freshman football, we play Somers and, uh, it was the first game of the season. And to make a long story short, I scored the touchdown and threw the two point conversion to my friend as a quarterback. So a lefty quarterback at that. And that wasn't my like normal position, but my coach, he knew I was like, coach, give me the ball. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, we, it was like the fourth, it was still nothing, nothing, like nothing was happening. We were getting so close and then getting pushed back. And then finally we got within 20 and like, I was like, all right, put me in, take, take Ethan out, put me in mm-hmm. and like, let's do that court. Like we had a whole quarterback sneak play Mm -hmm. where like I pretend to throw it and then I pretend to hand it off. And then I hold it down by my leg and casually walk the the line (laughs) and then boom, take off running. (laughs) And it worked. It worked. I had to dive and like hold it out in the hash mark and everything. And uh, the, the refs looked at each other and were like, touchdown. (laughs) And I was like, Oh my God, that worked. (laughs) And uh, the next day, like the school had like a production. So like they did the news every morning Mm -hmm. on this, on the TV. Everyone knew my name the next day. So it was, it was Jack Rice scored the touchdown to beat Somers and hadn't beaten them in so many years. So yeah, that was cool. That was a a cool, one of those cool, like, I, I don't know, looking back kind of glory days type of thing but uh heck yeah dude yeah i also got introduced to partying at that school okay so that's where that comes in were you there for all four years nope so (laughs) as like i just said i got introduced to partying i also got introduced to girls and girls liking me and me liking them and everything that goes along with it so uh that's when i started selling drugs and using drugs uh it was just weed and and drinking um at that time and since i came from the bad town or the bad city i was the they they looked to me for it Yeah. yeah basically so I I had no intention of doing that, but another friend was like, "Hey, we could we can we could do pretty well if you think about it." So one thing led to another, and um, yeah, we did. I was on the dean's blacklist. I was number one for two years in a row. This guy just had it out for me. He hated me. He looked for he'd uh, say he'd even like choreograph with the state police to come and like search all the lockers Mm. and we'd get tipped off from one of the secretaries in the office and then we'd hide everything and they were good like they had the dogs they had everything so it was if we got caught we were going to be in serious trouble Mm. but we never got caught so and so how long did you run that there then uh for the about one and a half years and then um they kicked me out, but it was like, asked me to leave politely. Hmm. They said, we'd, we'd not like to have you back next year. And my mom was like, all right, take him out. So took me yeah. out. And Did uh, your family have any idea why? No. Nah. No. Okay. No. Nah. They, they, and let me say this, my family, um, I came up with my family. Like we when i was born my crib was in the 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 kitchen of a basement apartment in brooklyn and then the next place i got uh half a room and then the next place i got my own room and then so every i kind of grew with my parents uh so to speak but no my i have a i come from a very good family my just the most uh the best parents anybody could ask for like everything that i've done in my life has been my decision or sometimes not my decision but they have always supported any and everything that i've wanted to do um and uh i took advantage of that um 
later on. But um, yeah, so I get kicked out. I, I go to Peekskill High School where, where my core group of friends are, but now I also have these friends that are all over the place uh, throughout the county. So um, that year was a pivotal year, though. I tore my ACL. My, you know, my, that whole season was um, depleted because that, I, they, were, I was, they were looking at me to go to a D1 for lacrosse. Hmm. So that was the plan. And then after the ACL, and then I played my senior year, they were like, he's he's good, but he'd have to play D2 for a year and then maybe go to D1. Just all the maybes I was, and this was, I was class of 2006. Um, so yeah, the way the world was at that time was a little scary as far as money. Mm -hmm. So I liked the idea of taking a year off and figuring it out, you know, or whatever, whatever college or people that don't go to college say. Um, and uh, I took that year off. I think I was in Westchester Community College for two months before I was kicked out again. They didn't. They politely asked me to leave, but they found out I was selling drugs to uh, one of my professors. Okay. So, um, uh, just uh, they had it all on camera. We just weren't weren't thinking. We thought it was like high school where they uh, they said the cameras were on, but they weren't, kind of thing. Just just an uh, error on my end. But uh, yeah, so get kicked out, and then. You know, things were bad. Like I I was already introduced to cocaine uh junior year and took a liking to it in, in, in the, high school? Oh yeah. Yep. In the in the uh parking lot after school. I remember it was it was the end of the year and, and it was like a just like a, a day a particular day where everyone was pretty excited. I remember that. And and uh so we're all hanging out side and and yes uh this kid Vinny, i'll never forget him he, he just had it on like a a limp biscuit cd case and was like you want to try it or something and i was like yeah why not and gave it a try and i was like whoa so uh yep fast forward i mean we we clearly realized that we could make a lot more money selling that than we could um we'd and I don't want to like glorify this stuff in any sort of manner, so I'm going to try to not. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, I went from selling to using, and it never went back to selling in that capacity ever again. Um, so, yeah, I went to basically for the next 10 years of my life. Um, I went to, I was in and out of rehabs, detoxes at first, and then it was uh, in and out of the correctional facilities um, in New York State. For selling? Nope. So that, um, uh, well, I had been in a couple times. One, at, one time was for selling um like I said, my dad worked in the Supreme Court, so I was able to get out of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, for good or for worse, look in hindsight, it's 2020, probably should have nipped it in the butt there. But um, one of the times I went in, it was um, I had uh, walked out of a convenience store, like a, a bodega in New York, we call them, and uh, somebody that was just a normal neighborhood kind of guy I, I know he was mixed up in the same stuff that I was but just in a different capacity uh he asked me to bu uh to bum a cigarette I used to smoke a pack a day um and I walked out and I handed him the cigarette but what I didn't realize were was there were undercover watching him and they had me on their radar as well so they didn't know what they saw all they know is they saw that we interacted so they converge, tase me, 
tased him. Well, I'm lucky one of the prongs like missed or misfired and didn't do the hook in, but the other one got me. <laughs> didn't knock you over. Yeah, and I was I was on a bike like a BMX bike, so I I had one hand on the handlebar, and I just remember it like almost like ejecting myself from the bike. I don't know if it had anything to do with a conductive or, or whatever. Yeah. And the guy that shot me was that <laughs> he, he used to teach the dare program in the school. So he like knew, like knew me, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But yeah, anyway, yeah. um, uh, yep. Yeah, so that was one of the times, um, another time, uh, a, a bunch of possession charges, um, that all would get like pushed down to misdemeanors, which would inevitably get pushed down to like community service, like so much of that stuff just on and on. Um, and then finally, I really did it, which was I got two DWIs within 30 days of each mm -hmm. other. So uh, the first one, it was just a simple pullover. And I actually did have uh I was I was in possession of narcotics, which they thank God did not find. They just uh, found that, that I would, had been drinking, mm. and um, I wasn't a big like drink and driving guy. Like you know, I think we all were. You know, if you had a few, you could be all right, kind of thing. And and that night I was actually like not not bad. So it was kind of it was kind of a a wake up call. Um, to it was the beginning of a wake-up call okay. and then the next one um an ex-girlfriend called me um i had already been in bed i had been sleeping for a little bit and she called me and she was drunk at a bar and uh needed to get picked up and i like i said i i, I was sleeping so i had just come home from another bar and was still kind of woozy and I uh, got in the car and didn't make it a block before I, I think I reached down to pick up my phone or something, but I, I basically put two cars up on their, um, their lawn, like just smashed into them. Thank God it was, you know, two in the morning and nobody was out and or on like the parked sidewalk. Cars? Yeah. Park cars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, uh, I can remember, uh, I remember sitting there and from my house to the police station was a straight shot. They just needed to get on the road and go. And, uh, yeah, I could, I could see the lights coming. And I was like, there was a moment of like, do I run and do the whole, someone stole the car thing or do I just sit here and take it? And I was just like, I think it's time to take it. So, uh, I did, I got arrested. Um, I was released though and put on a five-year felony probation. I'm going to speed this up because I I'm starting to realize if I if I talk about everything, we'll be talking way into the night. It's okay. I got time. Yeah. Um, I was put on five-year felony probation, and then I had a girlfriend at the time um, from Miami who, when when I was saying I was in and out of rehabs, that was all down in Florida. So I, I went to all the rehabs in New York. I went to two or three and, uh, nothing was clicking. I just wasn't ready. We, we, and uh, the lingo we, we would use was, it would, I'm just getting an oil change kind of mm -hmm. thing. You, you, you get cleaned up and then you go right back out. And, uh, at that time, everyone had Obamacare. So if you were under 26, you could go into what for a normal normal person would be a hundred thousand dollars for 30 day rehab we could go in for free mm -hmm. so in florida you could you could do that as much as you wanted so it's all been they figured it out and that they, they don't do that stuff anymore but um i mean i was even part of that whole system the whole uh you know, help run a rehab, you, you buy the, the drug tests at Walmart for 15 bucks and then you charge them or you charge their insurance $1,500 and you keep all the profit. 
So all sorts of scumbaggery and, and I mean, you name it, dude, I've done it. Like yeah. it's, yeah, it's, I, and I always knew it was bad, Sean, you know, I never sought out to be a, a drug addict. <laughs> I never saw, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't in the in the plans um but the deeper you get the with all the guilt and you know you're guilty that you just used so what do you do to 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 comfort that guilt you use more go back you know and and it's just an endless cycle and uh yeah anyway things caught up with me um and I was I had been homeless for quite a while at that point. I think about f- at four, yeah, six, probably like six months in okay. down in Florida. So like Fort Lauderdale area, anywhere from I live from Miami to West Palm Beach, and literally every town in between. So I could bounce all over the place just taking that train. I forget what it's called. Um, so would you, would you go into rehab, get out and then need a place to live before you went in again? Like that kind of thing? Yeah. So what they would do was the re you'd go into a rehab and then you'd go into a halfway house. And from the halfway house, the halfway house was almost like a rehab in itself. You know, you had to, you had curfew, you had to check in and there were different stages of this and, and you get more privileges as you go on type of deal. Um, I went down twice. So to go this second time in Florida, it had already been a year. And I think, like I said, I was homeless for about six months. And the way they caught me, because to go down there, I had a uh, ankle monitor for alcohol when I was on that probation. And my, I just came clean to my, my uh, probation officer. I said, you know, I haven't drank this whole time, but I've been using heroin and, and cocaine pretty daily. Um, so I need help. And she said, I'd never do this for anybody, but I'll do it for you. So she cut it off and mm. she said, don't make me regret it. And she regretted it because I immediately was on the run and uh, not checking in. So when you, mm. as soon as you don't check in, you're on the run or you go on the U.S. Marshals list. So I had done, I needed money and somehow I think I convinced my mom to send me like 20 bucks or whatever. And we used Western Union and it must have set off some type of something because they figured it out. And luckily I didn't get uh, caught up down there. They gave me the chance to come home and turn myself in. Uh, so that's what I did, uh, because Florida, I was in a one Florida jail for a day and I'll say that was probably worse than two weeks in Rikers Island. Are you serious? That's how, oh yeah, it's, 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 I don't know how it is nowadays, but that back then it was like, you know, I grew up in what I thought was a pretty tough kind of environment and when I tell you I've never been more scared than in those neighborhoods in Florida man I I really thought I'd be like losing my life Mm. at any you know any given day could have been it and I think that's why I went so so hard was because I just thought I was gonna die anyway so I was like let me just speed up the process but I was too much of a and I know this isn't what it is now but i I was too much of a coward to do it Hmm. you know to actually do it so i would trying to kill myself by drugs anyway i get caught i go turn myself in uh and then i go away for an extensive period of time to uh westchester county uh jail that has a prison inside um lucky me uh and uh does i mean did that make it a little less kind of serious in there as far as like the environment yeah okay. because um if i were to have gone upstate to like attica that would have been a bad situation for sure i mean 
I had status and I had some credibility going. Like when I went in, I also I knew some of the correctional officers, but I knew a lot of the prisoners. Mm. So like, like uh, I wasn't too too worried there. Um, and like, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to. Like you just kind of learn how to go day to day. The first week's terrible. You, you're like, this is my reality. This is what you call food. This is, I mean, the, I mean, the treatment in there is just so, so terrible. So you know, you're you're basically you're a number. You're an animal. Mm-hmm. You're to them. You know. Um, so it, that's also like the first time I re- really. I think I understood like racism and like towards um, not just towards the black community, but like how they really perceive, uh, you know, white kids and stuff like that. I don't know. This is kind of tough, man. Um, I never, I never under, I understood it from our point of view, from my point of view, but I never understood it from and I you know all my friends growing up were black Puerto Rican uh Jewish kids I had some Arab friends you know like literally everybody uh, my my first friend was uh his family's from China uh my my first language was Chinese we we could get back to that at another time okay. but um I yeah I, I just saw it was like the world was laid out in front of me in in this jail you know, so I, I, I use that time to, all I did was read, but I got really into books. So I was, I'd have like four books going at a time. And then I had like a crew that I hung out with all different, uh, uh, races, uh, creeds, whatever, um, different gangs. And, uh, because I was in a federal, uh, pot. So, people were in there for murder as well it was like it seemed to be you were either in there for murder or you're in there first uh i can't think of the word where they know you're part of something but they can't really prove it like conspiracy there it is conspiracy yeah a lot of a lot of conspiracies so um uh yeah and through in that 10 year period i had had a lot of albanian friends and people that i worked for to support my habit um and they were also embedded in that in that particular jail okay. um so i didn't it wasn't it wasn't so much that i had to like worry about my safety it was just i had to worry about my sanity so um yeah really just got into reading the books and um uh a lot of working out like i went in i think i weighed oh man probably soaking wet i'm five eight and i probably weighed about 115 pounds and then when i came out i weighed 170 pounds okay so i went pretty jacked (laughs) to yeah yeah (laughs) so i i came out and and now this will this will roll a little better so I came out, I was in New York for about two weeks. My aunt and uncle up here in Maine had offered to give me a chance to come up and work for my uncle um, and kind of try to go out on my own up here. So that's what I did. Uh, Were were you sober coming out of prison? No, I was for about, for about give or take two to three months. Okay. And then it started with drinking, which then led to everything else. But so that was in, I came here, I can just, just, it was, I remember by climate. So I remember showing up to prison in flip-flops coming from Florida. And then uh, I went, when I came here to Maine, it was uh, like three feet of snow and like we were working on rebuilt completely rebuilding a lobster boat uh in a barn just freezing and uh 
that whole next summer I worked at there. I can literally go walk outside and throw a rock and hit each and every one of them, but these three bars. So I had my last little like hurrah kind of thing. I worked in the food industry. So like, you know, just drinking every night and then towards, you know, doing drugs when I could or, or someone had some. And then towards the end of the summer, really being getting the hook back into me with drugs. So becoming addicted again. At this time, I had met who is now my ex, uh, Joanna. Um, but she kind of like took me in and, and tried to help, like really just just a great we're still good friends today. She tremendous person, just great heart. And uh, she kind of like put up with my BS for a few months. And then uh, when you're an addict, you, you always hurt the people that are closest to you first because it's easier. Um, so I think I had taken one of her and this is it's this is kind of how you know the universe kind of all works in mysterious ways but i had pawned one of her cameras hmm. and uh she i had i had, it was april 11th i had woke up i think i was just i was having coffee and a smoke out on the the stairs like the front stairs and and she came out with the slip the uh the pawn slip the receipt and uh i had never seen somebody like i had i i've robbed probably i mean hundreds of people hundreds and i mean from strong arm robbery to to scum bag under the table type of stuff you know like i i've ran with them all i know how to do it all it's um but the look on her face when she came out with that pawn slip man i'll, I'll never i'll never forget it just the pure disbelief how could somebody do this like are you know and uh so i put out my smoke and i walked which is right up the hill i walked down and uh, went to the chief of police and just said, his name's Bob Hash. And uh, I just said, I need help. And I'll, whatever you say, I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. he stopped, literally stopped everything he was doing and helped me. He took me to the hospital. He uh, paid, uh, I believe, out of his own pocket for uh, a week for me to stay in a hotel to start kicking heroin. Jeez. and just would give me a like a Hannaford food car to get some food every day and then I started going to uh AA meetings okay and yeah that was the real the real turning point wow that's you just had enough like you saw the look in in your girl's <laughs> eyes and like this is it let's go it's I think I was it, and it's a, a term used in the rooms mm -hmm. or in, in AA, but it's, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. And, um, I truly was, I mean, I, I knew I was either gonna drag this, this addiction and alcoholism thing out until, uh, you know, until I was, it, it would have been a slow and, very painful death or I was going to go to prison where I would never see anybody or anything for the rest of my life. Um, I had tried, I had tried, you know, by drugs, by by other means to, to kill myself. Like I just, I knew, I think I said before, like I knew what I was doing was bad. Yeah. And, and it just, it ate away so much. So, yeah, I I just didn't want to be who I was. I wanted to be the exact opposite. And um, yeah, just, I I don't know. I don't know if it was a, nothing, nothing like crazy happened. Like there was no, there was no jail. There was no homelessness. There was no, I think I was even like doing some odd jobs here and there. So like things were like, okay. 
but um yeah just something in my head just went off i i i attribute it to like a a spiritual moment or like a religious moment but Mm -hmm. it it's just whatever whatever turned that switch in my head i just have all the gratitude in the world for it because i i wasn't able to you know and and, uh yeah i i don't think i can take the credit for for doing the work and stuff like that but for that moment to happen i can't take the credit for that i i don't know how that happened well just to have you say his name was bob hash bob hash yeah just to have him be so receptive and help you out like he could have easily done any number of things that would have prevented you from getting better oh man and the the relationship that i've that i had with authority and police prior to that you would never catch me walking near the police station never mind walking into the chief's office you know what i mean so i knew but i knew that's what i had to do Mm -hmm. because he had like a month or two um before had um pulled me aside and kind of said hey i was just checking in just wanted to see if you needed any help you know with with maybe you're drinking or maybe you're getting into Mm -hmm. some other stuff he had like implied because he was a good friend of my uh uncle okay so uh uh but yeah i took him up on it and uh i did literally everything he said he he uh I put me up in that hotel. I kicked as much as I could there. And then my dad, they were still living in New York at the time. He had drove up and uh, his old lady, she uh, she took me in and put me above her. She had a garage and like a room above the garage. Like I was like talking to mice every night, like that kind of deal. Like it was, it was but it's what I needed at that time. And uh it was uh, very humbling, and um, I just slowly started. That's where I got that first job. I was working down at a dock uh, pumping gas for boats, so basically the Coast Guard every day just would pull up, and I'd pump their gas and uh, hop on my bike and ride home, and uh, I was still with jo- Joanna. She was keeping me at arm's length, you know, and and said you know you have to live on your own for a little bit and if it works it works um so i was on my own and i was doing things and um i had gone through the steps of aa there's the 12-step program Mm -hmm. and uh about a year after um after being sober for a year i had done that and doing I mean, people can say what they want about AA, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that program. Yeah. Um, it set a foundation and, and really, uh, the make, there's a step four is where you have to make your amends. Yeah. And man, that was the hardest thing I had ever done in my <laughs> life. I mean, just to, just to go to like, I mean, there's, there's still, many that i have to make um down in florida like i'm waiting a little more time statute of limitation kind of thing (laughs) but uh there's some people i'm gonna have to go down and say sorry to and and if it you know not all the sorries go good as a matter of fact most of them don't go don't go very good Hmm. but uh it's it's to teach you to to keep your side of the street clean and to kind of own up to it and and account for it. Um, And uh, yeah, after that, after that step, like life just opened. Like I, it was like a veil had been lifted from my eyes and I just saw life in this whole new perspective, Hmm. you know, and um, bikes were definitely it was the only thing I had, you know, it was the only, I was such a, that kid that was always skating, was always playing hockey or lacrosse or foot. I always was, I needed to do something and I needed, there needed to be danger involved. Hmm. So once I saw a vital raw, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's, <laughs> let's go. So, um, 
I saved the whole winter. I started working construction, um, should say that, uh, for Martin Builders here in Booth Bay Harbor. And uh, very good company, very professional company. So, um, you know, I had to, to get in a routine and I, I had to do that. And um, I learned a lot. I'm still never really stopped learning in that business. But um, yeah, I saved for a whole winter and I bought a Santa Cruz Bronson and boom, <laughs> that was it. I was hooked. Awesome. That, that, <laughs> that bike, that bike, yeah, changed my life. It was a it was a 2017 Santa Cruz Bronson where they still had the pivot up high, not down low. Yeah, like the shock was up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the shock. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man. Dude. Yeah. It's a lot. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but thank you for sharing all that. Like that, I can't imagine that's easy, and I don't know, just. I think it's a really incredible story for people to hear. And that's, that's a lot for me to hear. Like I had no idea about so much of that stuff. And Oh, sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to. No, don't say sorry. Surprise you. No, it's awesome. It makes the, you know, the fact that we met feel even better. Yeah. You man. know, that could help get you going to where you're going. And so just, yeah. yeah thanks for your transparency with that. Like, a, I can't imagine that's easy. And if I can do it, it took me well over 30 times of like putting in what I thought was a solid effort of trying to stop. And I, like I said, I was addicted to heroin. I was addicted to cocaine. Alcohol was always my base. I mean, I tried. The only thing I tried one time was meth. And thank God. Um, I can't imagine if I did that anymore. Um, but I was very fortunate um, because I lost a lot of friends on the way, um, both either to drugs and or to violence. And uh, I like to think that they're looking down at me now, like stoked, mm. you know, like yeah, like they are. Jack made it out, like mm. you know, like he's not he he's one of the the look. I mean, statistically, once you and I'm not afraid to admit this either. I I. I did drugs intravenously, so when I did heroin, I, it was through a needle. Um, uh, I sniffed it at first and uh, then graduated towards intravenous use. And once you start doing that, the percentage of you not just coming, just just to come out of it and not necessarily even live like a productive life is 1%. So to be part of that 1% is... Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm proud of it. Yeah, of you it. should be. You should be. I think yeah. someone's got a plan for you. It seems clear to me anyhow, but yeah, yeah again, thank you for that. And <laughs> want to talk about some, some lighter things about getting into bikes and taking pictures and, you know, how you've yeah. taken this, this new life into making us happy to see your, see your images coming from the races. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, you remember doing the pit bits for the U.S. Open, and you know, I want to give some credit to Zach Faulkner. He kind of kicked off the whole USDH thing, you know, covering oh, yeah. those series and stuff. And then, you know, it, yeah. it started to fall into your lap, and it seems like that. And Andrew just... Santoro, and also okay. Andrew Santoro, okay. big, big, uh, big influence up here in the Northeast, and and yeah, those two dudes, they're. They're solid Northeast, all about it. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if it wasn't for those guys, I wouldn't be here either. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like it's such a, like the East Coast has such a cool community. And like I say, East Coast, like as if it's from Florida to Maine, I guess it kind of is, but just maybe New England. But yeah, there's so much rad stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah. At, and it's it seemed to... It was, it seemed like super niche when I first came into it, but I think also with like, you know, the pro GRTs and the downhill Southeast, like there's been just in the last four years, so much crossover of like 
the Southerners wanting to go up there and then the Northerners wanting to go down South to race. It's, yeah. um, it's growing. It's yeah. growing. Yeah. It's been a good time over there. And so, you know, kind of, you helped kind of take over what Zach was doing at Vital with, you know, the USDH stuff and had that for a couple of years and it's worked out well, but you know, two years ago, finally got the call to go up to, to world cups. What was, you want to talk about what that first season was like? And I don't know, just cutting your teeth and being the new guy on the scene. Like, let's talk about that a little bit. Oh man. So, <laughs> <laughs> cause those are some fun uh, emails like hearing from you, like, all right, I think I've got certain things lined up. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh man. I, so if you remember, I had done, I had done the first West Virginia world cup. Yep. So I had, I had seen all those guys and then I did the second West Virginia world cup and I was, you had actually asked if I was able to go to Slovenia, but I, of course I didn't have a passport, mm. go figure, or I couldn't get it in time. I think yeah. I got it the, the week after and, uh, I was so pissed off, <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, uh, when, when it was, you know, for real, um, go time. You know, uh, I was lucky to have to have George from Pro Builds, George okay. Gomes. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, I, I'm not trying to gloss over everything you built at domestic races oh, because that's the reason, like, you're able to even do what you did. So yeah, yeah, yeah so and dive no, into all I, of those relationships. Like, I want to hear about. Yeah. Them. So like, uh, I had met George through the through our uh, just being in the Northeast, he was a big ESC goer, big, uh, just mountain Creek guy. So I'd always see him at mountain Creek and, uh, he had started the team pro builds and just me doing pippets and seeing something new. I was like, Ooh, what, you know, like, what's up? What do you got going on? And, uh, that's how I met George. And I quickly realized we were kind of cut from the same cloth, uh, just as far as maybe as like our experiences growing up as opposed to maybe the normal mountain biker or mm -hmm. typical elite downhill mountain bikers upbringing might have been or any of those. Uh, and I don't know, you know, maybe maybe there are more of these guys out there and I'd be interested to see in the comments yeah. if there are. But like just people that uh, had hit a bottom or you know have, have it's like we know we can look at each other and and see it and identify you know what i mean and to to overcome adversity type of thing and i i could see that in george and i could see this the drive that i had and match the drive that he had um so he was he had just signed valentina for her first junior year so he was going and to make it, you know, we were shoestring budget for both of us, you know, not having those established contacts yet or anything. And uh, I don't know, man, we just, I mean, some races I'd go with George, some races I'd go, I mean, me and uh, Fort William, I was with Rachel Pajal and Mana Salazar, like, what a weird bunch, but <laughs> here we'd, we'd, you know, roll up to the race in a van every day. Me and, uh, you know, two girls, one from Canada, one from El Salvador, mm -hmm. and just like kicking it. And there's, you know, man, I'm, I'm so proud of and, and feel so bad for her situation. But what a, what a person, man. She, I have a video whenever I like, really need a uh a, a pick me up or something i'll i'll go back to this video and it's it's just of rachel and mana and me just hysterically laughing hmm. after fort william because i never got my luggage rachel never got her bikes and i don't think mana did that well so like we were all so like just about to pop and then go someone home. said something funny and we just couldn't stop laughing and <laughs> it, it was just one of those most like genuine like just 
awesome moments and yeah. yeah yeah so whenever i need a like quick pick me up i'll 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 pull that up or send it to man or rachel or whatever but <laughs> yeah awesome. man it, we we didn't um yeah some sometimes i was with them or i'm trying to think there was another weird kind of stay situation it's escaping me right now but that the end of that year it was there was two races i think it was val de sol and leger were both back to back so george and i had split basically a rental camper van mm -hmm. and uh george was beginning to realize that this was going to be a thing or like it was either going to go one way or the other and for me it was either going to go one way or the other mm -hmm. so we had this very emotional last two weeks of i mean the, if you could have heard some of the things we said to each other in that van i mean we'd probably go to jail just <laughs> by like the threats we made to each other and just like <laughs> you know but all out of love all out of 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 growing in the sport mm -hmm. and and not you know because nobody wrote wrote the handbook on this thing you got to figure it out for yeah. yourself you got to get out there um and that's that's what we did we just showed up you know we just kept showing up and, and i think that really is is what got us to where we were we just we just wouldn't stop showing up we wouldn't stop shutting up we wouldn't stop just posting stuff and yeah it was for me it was i mean it was my first like time in europe and and taking that all in i also got super sick in andorra like the most sick i'd ever been which just recently got cleared up i had gotten a stomach uh first they thought it was a, a tapeworm then it went to a bacteria then it went to a tapeworm again and then i just basically the past year and a half i haven't been able to uh, I haven't lost, I lost weight. And then when I try to put it back on, I got, I'm about at 140 and I can't get over it. And I know I should be in that 160, 170 range kind of thing. So now, now as of like a week ago, it's supposedly cleared up. So I'm hope, hoping that uh, I'll get back after it, okay. all that. But uh, yeah, so that first year, man, that was like, wow, that, you know, and, you know, I know what it was like to to be at a World Cup in the U.S., but I'd never. When you go to Europe and you you show up to your first one and you go in the grocery store and you see a big banner of Loic Bruni in the grocery store, you're <laughs> like, "What the hell?" And then, um, yeah, just the the fans over there. The it's such a our sport is so loved, man. It, it's it's crit the people that that get into it and and really love it i mean people go to races in italy that drive down from like poland and like you know all these crazy places and you're like wow this 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 sport really has something you know and, yeah. and just that and and operating you know alongside like sven and and boris and ross and nathan and all the guys that i looked up to you know that was a thing all in itself too like learning figuring those guys out you mm -hmm. know figuring out the etiquette of the hill i remember like one uh uh one shot that i took of uh finn isles and that famous uh uh i think it's the final corner of lenzer high that like real right before they go off the drop mm -hmm. into the finish area and i had i was doing pit bits but i knew we also needed some action and i was you know trying to cut corners so i just instead of taking the lift up i just kind of ran up the hill mm -hmm. and i was like oh this corner is awesome um i had just run up over like that like knoll where they the drop is and that perfect corner was there 
and like Finn had just come around it and it was practice. So he like shrouded it and I just, I took the shot and it was, a, a, I liked it. So I posted it and then Boris was like, dude, what's up? And I was and like the next day and I was like, what, 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 what do you mean? He was like, he was like, he was like, what are you going to shoot on race day? And I was like, oh, that's right. I was like, there is there is a little bit of an order of operations to this, isn't there? Kind of thing, you know. It wasn't, and I know, like, uh, yeah, it, maybe I at the time I was like a little offset, off put by that or whatever. Like, like I'll do whatever I want, kind of thing. But in a way, I think he had a. He was just he was trying to help me, but it just didn't it it didn't come off right at the at the time, but. He in a it, in a way he was perfectly right because when it came time for race day, all we had to shoot was the corner, the drop, and the finish. So it just it just set the seed in my head to to plan your shooting. Don't just wing it. Don't just run up and 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 you know it 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 made me realize that okay I need to even though I think I, 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 I'm in a groove and, and that I have this certain knowledge of this sport and how to, how to, uh, capture it. Um, there's, there's levels and I was at, a you know, a pretty low level, um, as far as, uh, order of operations goes and stuff like that. But all right, you can't shoot a corner at the end until race day. <laughs> I know. Should I text it's, Boris? Sounds, <laughs> no, no, no. Just He's going to hear this anyway. <laughs> I love you, Boris. Don't, don't the best. Um, but no, all those and and to their credit, man, they've. I mean, this year it was it was. Yeah, out of all those guys, it, everyone just. They're just so willing to help. You know, and I, I, I thought the opposite. I'd heard horror stories, and and yeah, if you're just some dude showing up, that's like just trying to get some like sick photos for your Instagram, and like not really like have like a a plan or like a passion. Like, yeah, you will get kind of chewed up and like told to like get out of the way because, um, yeah, you're not. I don't think you're there for the right reasons. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Certain people are there trying to make a living. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and I needed to realize that too. Um, especially that first year, um, like I did not, you know, how important those getting those initial shots of the weekend are where, you know, no crowds in there. And then you want to get shots where there are, there's some crowd and you don't want to, you know, we all kind of tend to get clustered up in these in these spots, and you know, you see a whole group of us all shoot in the same spot, and uh, that's because it's it's a sick spot, and it's almost like competitive too. Like who shot that corner the best, or like who's made it out there the the most kind of thing. Hmm. Um, but I I mean, you can ask them, but. I usually try to avoid those gatherings, even though it's fun <laughs> it, to, to hang out with your, you know, you're the only other people that understand what you do for your living. But uh, it it is better to keep it moving, I think. <laughs> Just keep it moving down the hill a little bit and holler up every now and then when you get lonely or something. But... Was, was there anything that first season that let you down or disappointed you you know like maybe some expectations you had that weren't met anything like that meeting sven and boris and dan for the first time they let you down yeah <laughs> no they didn't let me down they they i i thought i was gonna be i thought it was gonna be like a, oh you know we all work for vado kind of thing like powwow but it wasn't and it was just, you know, it wasn't anything bad. It was just very cordial. But I thought they'd be like, you know, here's the keys to the cool club or whatever. But um, mm -hmm. I guess it exceeded my my expectation. I, it really showed me that how much more there was to, to what I was doing. 
I think I was so mm -hmm. set in on the local circuit and having that to like, like a, a fine oil, oiled machine, if you will, you know, like I had that process down pat, you know, like I could finish the, the race, be home in a few hours, get to editing. And by the time I went to bed, I knew that whatever was coming your way, I was good to go. Hmm. When World Cups got introduced, um, first of all, it's, you know, you're dealing with the best of the best. You, they never, they never look bad. They never, it's very, it's very hard to take a bad shot at a World Cup. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're especially mm -hmm. guys like, like win. Like I, I was trying to the other, uh, maybe two weeks ago now. I was just going through all my win photos and just to see if there was like a not good one of him, of just his body English and his positioning. And I mean, the guy is on it all the time, and it's it's, yeah. You just have it, you. You're a bad photographer if you can't get a good shot of him. <laughs> but um yeah man it was uh it that first season um was was great and and just i think that's the way i needed to learn it you know to mm. to not be uh pampered or or not you know and it and it, it kind of falls in step with with what i've done my whole life you know like i've never really when I started hockey, I sucked. When I started lacrosse, I sucked. You know, like anything else, it's just it, it, practice makes perfect. So the more you, the more you show up, the more you do it, the more you fig, kind of figure out. You know, that's cool. Do you want to segue into how twenty twenty three started and getting the camera that you have and, oh, and God. that whole thing? Yep, and I'll try and... that story. That story is ridiculous, and dude. Some people thought you put it out there for the fundraiser, like for the GoFundMe. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. And I was like, no, uh-uh. Oh, no, no, no. 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 So let's tell that story. Yeah. Tell that story going into 23. So um, I had, um, so it's 2023. I have, uh, I use Canon uh, cameras. So I have my, my Canon 5D Mark IV, which, you know, I, I, I made it to a World Cup on a 7D Mark One, and that's <laughs> that's saying something. So, to me, that you know, I still have it. It still it barely works, but it works. Um, and and that's uh, why I sent out the initial post was because I had been shooting some. I think I was in my second or third downhill southeast. And it had just come back from the Canon factory, like getting a, uh, um, the, it's like a 24 count check and, and some things need to be replaced. It was su supposedly good to go, but it's still, the buttons felt sticky and I was just like, the world cups were coming up. And, uh, so in my head, I was thinking, Okay, there's a guy I remember being on the hill down south, and he said, "If you ever need help with Canon stuff, to just get to hit me up, because hmm. uh, they helped me out. Like he was like a rep or something." So I didn't remember who that was. So I, there was that, and then there was also some other photographers in the south that I knew had extra camera bodies, not, not on the five D or 1d or any of those levels like a lot lower but i i knew for a f you need a second body if you're going to shoot a yeah. world cup you you can get away with it at a local race for sure but that world cup you especially all the money you're putting in and you better just have your your you know eyes dotted and t's crossed or whatever but um yeah. So me freaking out one night, realizing all this, I had made a story post uh, just asking, it was something along the lines of like, hey, uh, I'm realizing that my camera isn't doing so well. Would anyone happen to either have an extra 
or know somebody that can put me in touch with somebody at Canon to possibly borrow an extra body because I was even going to try to rent the 7D Mark II, but they were, since it was such a long block, we were, you know, we were gone from the U.S. for a month or just over a month. So with, it was like off by a day that I couldn't get this rental. Oh, so man. once that happened, that's when I, I think that's what set off the freak out actually. Um, anyway, I put this message out there and then I wake up and I see the, the crowdfunder and I see who put it up. Meredith, um, Meredith Burnett, who is the mother of one of, of, um, Declan, Declan, I got it. Declan Burnett. Okay. Um, so his mom and this family has just been like super supportive of me like always just like they all are i i can't tell you man how many of these these families and uh racers and and organizers just salt of the earth people dude it's we're really really fortunate to be to have these people but anyway so i yeah i wake up i see it and then i ask meredith if she can take it down Cause I'm like, you know, at this point I'm like, Whoa, like, like that's not <laughs> how you really, you asked her. Oh yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, can you, I was like, I really appreciate it, but can you please take it down? Like that, this is not how I like, <laughs> this isn't how I roll. Like this feels weird. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I don't know what to do. And, mm. uh, she said, can you give it another hour? And I was like, okay. And, um, and had you looked at it or like nope. seen if it had progress or anything? Nope. Okay. I didn't take one look. And I told her that from the beginning. I said, I'm not, I'm uh -huh. not looking at it. And, uh, uh, someone who I, everyone wants to know who this person is, and I'm not going to say it, um, because it, it just doesn't matter. And I like people wanting to guess anyway. Um, but anyway, someone who I, I respect very, very much, um, not someone that, anyone would really know anyway but who very loves our sport and and everything that we do um had called me and said you know these people are trying to do do something for you you know mm -hmm. uh, you know they can buy your your photos for 15 bucks on roots and rain till the till the cows come home but they're clearly trying to do something genuinely nice for you so why don't you put your ego aside and let them do it for you and hmm. me taking the advice of others that i know know well way more knowledgeable than me just on life in general especially this life uh because i kind of consider that my past life and this my new one um sure uh i let it go i said all right you know what i'll make you a deal and it, my neighbor who's like a foil border dude, but like really into like what I do and is very supportive as well. He saw it uh, as well. So he was like, dude, this is so cool. And I was like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I was like, <laughs> I was like, tell me, I was like, if, if it's doing good, like tell me in like an hour. And then an hour comes, he's like, bro. And I was like, are you serious? And he was like, be ready, man. So, um, that day had gone by. I didn't check it. I just, the last thing I heard was it's doing good. And I think that was from Meredith because I spoke to her before I went to bed. But then uh, the next morning I woke up to um, another message saying, you better start looking for a new camera. Um, so she had set, set it at 6,000 and we, in under 24 hours, that had been hit. And, uh, yeah, I, I got, I have the best, the best camera money can buy right now. And it's all because of just our community and the people in it. And so good, dude. Uh, yeah, I, I, I still can't really like wrap my head around that. And, and I've watched her in between that just like to help help somebody else out with something and i mean it's just it's 
so inspirational. I mean, you can't help yeah. but be like, and uh, even like the the nationals. Like I really didn't. To be honest, man, I was so beat from from that first block. Like to go straight into nationals. Like I didn't have to do that kind of thing. But since I think the majority of the people that contributed to it to that uh gofundme and and uh especially the downhill southeast kind of family i just i felt like no you you have to this yeah and 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 do a damn good job because these people are the the reason you're able to do what you're able to do so Hmm. um yeah i wasn't able to make it uh to any of the other downhill southeast um because of the world cup schedule which was a bummer because I did want to like, you know, show them, show it off and, and, and yeah, just, just go hard. Uh, Mariah, um, Mariah Lacey picked it up and she did a great job. Another great, uh, Southern photographer that's surprisingly not a dude and just yeah, kills cool. it. Yeah. Super rare. <laughs> and, yep. but, uh, yeah, she's great, great photographer. And, uh, yeah, just that whole thing, man. I, I yeah, they'll, I'll, I'll never not pay it forward because of that, mm-hmm. you know. And, and yeah. it's that's how it should be, I think. Yeah, I, uh, you have people around you giving good advice, and I'm glad that, you know, you listened and were told to, to let it see its course, so people giving can feel the joy of giving something to someone. Yeah. Who needs it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's such a rad story. I was bummed because I didn't even see, like, I'm not on Instagram, you know that, nah, but I'm like, yeah, guess what? This, you know, you explain what happened. I'm like, what? Like, I've bummed out. Like, I would have given to that in a heartbeat. Oh, man. <laughs> no, I, dude. And like, yeah, and there, there was some weird stuff with that too. Like, people are like, so you didn't check it. You don't want to like think all these. And I'm like, dude, if I, if I, I just, I wrote one like very, encompassing thank you to everybody yeah that's all you need to i do. think they understand if you know yeah but even that like i felt bad like i was like man i should send these people a card or something but you know the world cups were coming and they yeah. they know what they were giving you like they saw your photos like they knew they were part of that so yeah yeah let's uh how about some highlights of 23 for you the world cup season well first year being on a factory team um Mm -hmm. transition factory racing which george and i's uh uh fighting and all that not even fighting just like woe is me and 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 all that you know um a winter the winter was really the toughest because no one knew what was happening you know what the schedules weren't coming out and stuff like that but once once i knew george and rachel and lars from transition that that was going to be a team plus the work that i do for vital i mean dude i was just so stoked to not have to like barter photos for a place to stay because they took care of um all our lodging all our food and when you're doing that kind of stuff overseas that is such a huge component of day-to-day going on and uh so to have that and travel from the airport taken care of i mean this is this is stuff that the years prior i had to work out myself plus do all the work on on top of it um for you and whoever i was working for at the time so um uh and when we first started it felt like everything was going to be normal like i really felt like everything was like it was almost it felt too good to be true that first race i was like that wasn't so bad you know like they they seemed to get it and 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 this you know the i didn't i didn't even understand what semis were i thought they were just practicing (laughs) <laughs> like like when people were saying semis i thought i was like oh new word for uh um qualifying but uh, no that was a that was a time quality i i 
I think you and I talked about it. I was like, my bad. I didn't know that they were <laughs> doing this. And, and uh, so, um, yeah, get, for me as a photographer, it was just an extra, extra, um, extra advantage to get a shot of my rider. Like, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So, or, so to me, it didn't really uh, matter in the beginning. Um, but once they started going and the schedule first, the first thing I noticed was, so my, you know, I'm staying with the team. I'm relying on the, the team schedule to be also my schedule. So I'm seeing it change and I'm like, what the heck's going on? Like, is it, is it us or is it, you know, what's going on? So I've come to find out it's, it's not us. It's, it's the federate or not the federation. It's, uh, uh, would it be UCI? Yeah. Yeah. So whoever's handling. Those yeah, decisions. yeah. 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 So sure. USI, um, you know, they the schedule started changing like last minute and I was like, Whoa, that's kind of can't be doing that. Like these, these guys got this like down to a science, like you can't change things. And, and yeah, it's just, I mean, we're mountain bikers. Clearly we don't do well with change as it is, but to, <laughs> to, to be like, on the day and even bumping something up an hour can be detrimental if you have something planned out. So, um, yeah, just, it kept, you know, and I'm also the first month I'm spending in Europe ever in my life with Mm. nine of us or however many of us all from different walks of life. I mean, Tristan's from, uh, Quebec, Tristan Lemire's from Quebec, uh, Valentina's from Colombia, Valentina Rojo Sanchez, and then um, the Oscar sisters, Taylor and Aletha, they're from out by you, I think, or, or, or up um, in Washington. Mm-hmm. So, like, and then Rachel and George and the mechanics. So, like, having all these people under one roof, in most situations, they'd split us up when they could uh and uh yeah just doing that whole thing and getting to know everybody's you know what they like what they don't like what everyone eats what everyone doesn't eat uh Mm -hmm. what everyone's favorite topic of conversation is what what you know all that stuff so Mm -hmm. it was so much that by the like i said about the the uh that uh national race coming home like i was so smoked dude i i mean coming home was so tired just because it it was a whole new level of like you know and just the mental your, challenge involved oh absolutely and yeah. you know wanting to to impress transition and and wanting to you know still continue to do what i do for vital at the same level it was it was just so much more full on and granted i was using a brand new camera too so i'm like figuring out a brand new camera that might not have been the best decision but trust me i know that camera pretty good now yeah but for sure there's a learning curve with buttons and placements and features yeah just just uh mirrorless to or uh mirrors to mirrorless was Mm -hmm. you know i said i'd never do it and then i here I am and I have the best mirrorless <laughs> camera there is uh-huh. at the moment. But uh, it's there was a learning curve. Um, it wasn't too steep. But this thing, I think I've maybe unlocked at best 30% of what it can do. Yeah. Like this thing is crazy. <laughs> um, even just, uh, who was it, Ben Wilson or Carson told me about the the video stabilization internal button and i was like i would have never known that was there and i was just (laughs) filming stuff like and then i turned that on and now i have cinematic quality shots of my neighbor (laughs) foil boarding like (laughs) like it's it's crazy but that's what i love about it is we're all a big community we're all you know where when i came in i felt like it was more of like a like jockeying for position and kind of like more cutthroat Mm. and as the years have passed i've i kind of feel like everyone's getting on this like 
and it might just be me. I might be just out of my fucking head. Part of my language. I might be out of my head and just seeing it different, but it feels like everyone, all the media side of this is like bringing each other up more, hmm. not necessarily trying to step on each other's toes, but like, that's why I love like, uh, you know, Carson Fletcher, Ben Wilson, Nick Robertson, uh, Mariah, uh, just like, we have such a uh, a couple more that I'm forgetting. I'm I'm sorry. You know who you are. I love you. Um, such a solid group that, uh, you know, any I can call those guys at three in the morning. They'll answer. You know what I mean? Just because yeah. we got each other's backs. You know what I mean? Like, and if someone does well or if someone gets a, a new gig, we're all stoked. You know, it's not like dang, I wish I got that one, you know what I mean? So yeah. that, I'm very thankful that we're not at each other's throats because I, I have heard, like, the horror stories and stuff of, like, you know, stuff going down on the hill and seeing some of it a little bit in the beginning of when I started and and just that now we're, we're kind of pulling each other up. I think it all it does is is helps and makes mm. makes things better. Yeah. Cool. Talk about uh, having a World Cup champion on your team. She is something else, dude. Uh, (laughs) I and it's funny because Valentina, you know, Valentina doesn't speak very the best English as of yet. Um, She's getting there. She's she's doing well with her classes and stuff. But there is a very clear distinction um from her to anyone else on the team um and any other junior at that age what that i've seen with such determination and just like you're you're not going to get in the way of what she's trying to accomplish by any means she is she's like I was when I started, like, I'm. my goal was to be a World Cup photographer. So that's all I threw myself out. Now I want to be the best World Cup photographer. You, that, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But she's, she's going to be the best in the world. And you, you see, you can feel it when you're around her. It's a, it's a, it's like a, uh, how do I phrase that? She's she's her own energy ball. Like, I can hmm. feel how she's feeling just by being near her. And I know, I mean, I've, I've done pretty good at calling it out so far. Like, yeah, she's on, she's going to, today's the day kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, like, you she, you know, she's, um. Yeah, man, she's so, and she's so small to see her just, I mean, dude, I can't do half of what she can do on a bike. And she is just, the way she attacks those courses, dude, is, yeah, it's, you don't, there's no, uh, that's where the, the language, the language barrier is broken is when you see her ride a bike, you just, it's all about, I'm going to win and I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, I don't care if the team is doing something uh, or some politics are going on or whatever. I'm here to win, and I can't understand most of you guys anyway, so screw it anyway. <laughs> so, but uh, she's uh, she's something special, man. I think we've we really just are just seeing the beginning of a, a real world world class athlete that's just getting started, and I'm I'm very proud proud of her um uh yeah just seeing her when she showed up for the first time and she met george for the first time i mean you have to understand they they went out on a huge win i mean they never even met each other and that the first time they met was at lords so watching them i mean i'm uh, inevitably i'm gonna have to write a freaking book or something (laughs) because i've watched them progress you know and and from meeting each other to 
to you know george had to be her like mechanic and like her everything for that first year and uh now that he's in a more of a the managerial position and uh he can be out on the track he's way more of a help to her and and she just watch seeing her realize that she can use the team and like then watching Taylor realize she can use the team and then seeing Tristan realize he can use the team like hey can you go check this line for me like they're almost like hesitant to ask and mm-hmm. I think they don't realize like that's why we're there yeah. is to help is to help them we're a team and uh so to see that the communication and I don't, you know, I see how other teams do it and have like a general idea, but ours is very, very precise for being a very new team. I mean, hmm. I'm t- I've, I try to like not look at it or not have any uh, interference unless I see something that's very obvious with one of the riders. Like hmm. I'll say, or someone's got a flat, they're coming at you, or, or I'll very rarely say someone was offline but if i do see it i'll say it you know um Mm -hmm. but having george on the hill and having mechanics having uh rachel to work logistics having all that just made it so much easier to do my job i i couldn't have if i didn't have the team i couldn't have done this past season i don't think yeah so cool i'm glad it's all worked out yeah yeah On that note, um, like you're generally pretty diplomatic, you know, that's, that was obvious in your, your last race interview with everyone, but, oh um, yeah, what are your thoughts on next year? I'm going to be honest, um, 50, 50. Yeah. Like part of me feels like, and I really took what Loic said to heart because we we had spoken a little bit before that and we had spoken at length after that um more about what like his coaches had to say like Laurent and and gentlemen like that um I think I mean I can just look around the country and know that our sport is is healthy and there's people taking interest and and healthy meaning that we're getting better, that it mm-hmm. seems to be going up. Um, and the the level of our riders is also going up tremendously, especially like when Asa Vermet hits the track or mm-hmm. when, when Aletha gets to the track. I mean, the rest of the world's going to know about it. You know, yeah. these, these kids are incredible already putting down pro times at, at local races and stuff but uh yeah i just i i think next year is gonna be it feels like i mean seven races was all already kind of a bummer like ah come on i thought we were gonna get we were like they were like borderline complaining about having too many like i thought i thought we were gonna have like 20 races or something like, <laughs> oh, you know with all the all the all the things you hear around the pits um so kind of bummer that it's only seven um or is it eight with the i think with it's eight the, with world the, champs okay so that's not bad but, but seven for world cup yeah yeah i mean i think next year um it's gonna look different I think we both know that for sure as far as teams and and where riders go and stuff like that. Um, But I think if we can all just go through next year and try to really hammer out the details, I mean, they have had, they have to have a a complaint list. I don't even want to know what it is, how bad it is, but they know that stuff needs to be done. I kind of got that vibe from them. And um, I think it, it, it would have been very hard to make the changes that people had thrown out there um, to be implemented so fast and in the middle of a season when there already were changes that had to be made. 
Um, that being said, I think next year people will have a better uh, plan of attack as far as like a, a team perspective, like mm-hmm. logistics and and stuff like that. And the me- and media guys too. I mean, we'll know how to how to go after it a little bit better. I mean, the first half of the season was me like trying to figure out how to schedule, how to how to do it and maximize not only my time on the hill, but editing time because yeah, yeah, what we do looks awesome because you see us just taking pictures on the hill and we got, you know, we're around the best in the world and, and all that. But what you don't see is the hours and hours and the cursing at your computer and, (laughs) and, 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 you know, missing dinner or eat or, you know, just to, to get the job done. And yeah. we do it because we love it. It's, it's, it, that's, we're lucky. We're, I, I think so, at least. I think we're very fortunate to get to do what we do. But it's, it's hard because, um, well, it's hard to, it's hard to make a living. Um, yeah. I think I'm almost there. I think I'm almost there where I'm comfortable. It was nice that Sven said he started his career at 35. And mm-hmm. I'm 35, so I was like, <laughs> "All right, all right." So, and he was already like pretty ingrained at that point. So yeah. I think I'm like, "All right, now I'm kind of ingrained." Like people are starting to know my name and like see my face more and more. So I'm like, like I said, I want to be the best. I want to be. I want to be the Sven. I want to be the, the, uh, the Boris, the Funked, the you name them. I I love them all and yeah. and. I want to be one of those names and um, not only for like my ego and to say that I accomplished something to like my grandkids one day, (laughs) but I, I have, I have seen like the direct connection of putting out rad photos of, of like local kids and seeing those local kids go to world cups. Hmm. And I, I do think the them having media, of themselves to like present to their their friend group or or whatever because it's such a niche thing that like how do you i mean if some if i was in high school and some kid was like no dude i'm not going to the party because i got a race this week and i'd be like what the fuck or what you know (laughs) what is wrong with you man (laughs) um but uh I think them if I if I saw a picture of it I'd be like oh never mind you you should you should definitely go do that for mm-hmm. what you're not missing out at all trust me yeah um so and that's also why I love this <laughs> sport so much is because these kids have this and they love it and you can see it you can see the passion and it's it's I wish I had it mm-hmm. you know I, yeah. I for sure that turns out that um, where I went to high school in Peekskill has some of like the best trails in New York. Hmm. And like we part, all we would do in those woods was throw bonfire parties and yeah. the cops would come and we'd have to like run. But if I only knew like I had world-class mountain biking trails in my town, you know, like a, yeah. it could have, should have, would have, but basically when I see, uh, uh, for some reason, the Austin San Susi's coming to mind. Just incredible rider out of the South. Very, he's like a a Dakota Norton mini me. Like they, <laughs> they he he's been uh, at the beginning of the season. He wore the same kit that Dakota had the last season, okay. and I just could I couldn't tell. I literally could not tell them apart. <laughs> and um, uh, it I had to it came to a point where I had to be like, Hey, you have to like change your, your goggle color or something because I can't <laughs> figure this out. And, uh, because he's so steezy and, and just replicates that, that DAC kind of style. Mm. And, uh, but he, he was, he would be so just like fired up about photos, like seeing, I didn't like, like I could feel it like, like, you know what I mean? When like, mm-hmm. you know, sharing it to him directly or whatever and then be like, wow, you know, <laughs> like, when you see that reaction, you're like, okay, this, you know, 
I get that reaction too. But like seeing it on you is so much cooler. And then, you know, people buy your photos and they'll like take a picture of it on their wall. And you're like, holy, sh you know, it just, it's, it's mind boggling, man. It's like someone did that the other day and I was like, I didn't even remember that I did that. And you, you look at that photo every day, Yeah. you know, and, and, uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, I want to kind of shout out Dave Richards. Um, he's, a works with specialized and he's been able to, he, he sets up like the pits and stuff for like when they come overseas here, but he also runs like their demo program and he lives, um, about an hour away from me here in Maine and we that's pretty much your neighbor when you're in Maine so mm -hmm. um he's he's been able to provide a bike for me and he just because I had to I don't know if it was two or three years ago I had to sell I had to sell a bike to pay rent my cage yeah it was my KHS I had to sell a KHS to pay rent mm -hmm. uh just to get through and uh he lent me a bike that now is my bike but um he knew he he could see just in like that amount of time how much i needed to ride you know what i mean like when i'm when i'm away or when i'm on a trip the the whole the whole thing started was started with me being like okay i'll be a mountain bike photographer surely i'll be able to ride more and and I'll have more <laughs> opportunities to ride little did i know uh it's the opposite you mm. have to really make an effort especially going overseas uh to get up you know to have a bike with you and and do all that stuff i didn't this year maybe next hopefully next year we'll see if not it's all good we'll get yeah. a scooter or something but <laughs> like um it because as soon as i got home and i jumped on my you know specialized evo i could just zip all monsignor in west virginia it was no problem mm. and like i can remember even like passing andy vathis and being like or or not andy uh ross and being like no nah, he was walking and i was like now nah, you know how it feels <laughs> you know like because <laughs> because i'm always a guy walking like a uh -huh. mile like mile to get to to the mountain or whatever <laughs> but yeah man yeah it's cool it's just it's just the best yeah it, nothing nothing beats what what we do and um yeah i think i'm finally getting to that point where i can like you know i well it's I'm going to have to make a decision. You know, I'm going to have to say I can either do this and because I am, I'm 35. Um, I would like to, to have a family in one of these days. Um, I haven't had a, a girlfriend make it past two races yet. So <laughs> maybe I'll get that one. That'll make it past lucky number three. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I do, this is a very, any, you, uh, you uh kids out there or, or grown-ups or whatever that are that may consider this as a job or want to show up to the hill please do first of all because the more the merrier and uh but just know that if you want to do this at the highest level it is all encompassing from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed you are eating breathing sleeping drinking and mountain biking and photography yeah. and you know relationships do suffer because of that mm -hmm. um but if you love it and you're passionate about it enough um i think you'll come and i think you'll stay and and make our sport better all i want to do is like show people like how cool our sport is like sure. how it's sick i i haven't not one person has been like what you do is lame or like the sport is lame. Like they all like, they love it. I mean, my, my dad is not a big sports guy, mm -hmm. but he's like, how did Danny Hart do? And I'm like, that's awesome. What, the, what are you talking about? He loves Danny Hart. Um, I don't know. It just, I guess the name stuck with him and he's just, he's a big Danny 
big Danny Hart fan. Awesome. But, uh, yeah. Just just grateful. Just grateful for, for everything and, and and everything you've done for me. I mean, you took a shot on me when, you know, I I think like you said, I think it, this is all kind of like meant to be somehow or yeah. like divine intervention. I mean, there has to be something said about it. I mean, my my philosophy has been once you know one foot in front of the other and and have do things with the right intention and doors just fly open it, yeah. it's the the darndest thing and like to have real life problems now like i'll take hmm. i'll take my worst day as is as might sound corny too but i'll take my worst day now over my best day in my past life hmm. in a heartbeat yeah you know what i mean for it, sure i yeah, but to have a second chance and and or a fiftieth chance or whatever it is to do this and to keep it up, I mean, I'm just I'm having the time of my life. I mean, we're going into winter now, so I'm not going to be having the time of my life really. But you'll, uh, you'll work in the winter, kind of, you know. What's that? You'll be working. Yeah, I'm gonna work. Um, I'm kind of deciding still if I want to maybe try to make a push to the south for a few months mm-hmm. just to break it up because yep. there is a do because of all the things that I've kind of gone through and put myself through I do have PTSD I do have depression um these are all uh manageable things mm-hmm. and and things that I manage uh both by speaking to someone which if you don't and you or even have a thought, should I go see a therapist? You should go see a therapist. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Yep. And uh, there's no shame in it. I, I love seeing my therapist. Mm. I give her a big ass hug every time. <laughs> I mean, that lady saved my life. You know, she mm. it took it truly took this whole town from my doctor, the chief, uh, my family. I can't thank my my family and just for sticking by me. I mean, in you know, they had to write me off for dead to, for me to, for them to go about their, their lives. You know, that that's the only, when you're dealing with it for that long as a parent, and it's the first thing that I tell any parent that's dealing with a child or a loved one or anything, I say, the first thing you have to do is stop helping. Hmm. And it sounds cruel and, and all that, but you all you're doing is enabling and uh enabling kills more people than i think people realize and um so that's always the first thing i say is just stop helping them and start erasing them from your mind Hmm. it sounds terrible i I know it does but that's what my family had to do uh for them to go about their day-to-day lives and not have this pit in their stomach that they could get a call that their son's going to be dead Hmm. so they accepted that uh to to move on and and yeah i i don't know how i got here again but uh um i'm very 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 fortunate that all these things have lined up the way that they have and that i have the people in my life that i have you know including you most definitely including you um we're we're fortunate to to have you so yeah yeah. well i appreciate that yep i really do and i just i really just hope i can keep doing it because it's it's all i think about it's Mm -hmm. it's what i love to do and um yeah we're just we're lucky to to have downhill i mean yes we are so yeah it's great (laughs) awesome I've been talking for a while, uh-huh. haven't we? Two twenty, yeah. yeah. I think I think it's a good spot to wrap up. We miss anything? I had some questions uh, from God. A couple basic questions from the crew, but you've kind of covered yeah. everything. So, yeah. Anything specific they want to know? I, I I I'm an open book. Nico asks, "How has the scene changed since 2018, and where do you see the future?" Schroeder asks, "What was the hardest part about getting your foot in the door to shoot?" world cup stuff uh, ben wilson here's his quote 
I miss you. When will you ride bikes with me? <laughs> and he's joking, but then he mentions that it was, it's always been an important part for you guys to capture content, but then um, do your riding, get some riding done if you can too. So, yeah, that's the most, that's literally every day. So I have a, a rescue dog, Thor, who mm. everyone, if you know me and you follow me, you know Thor and you know <laughs> this little one over here. Hey, wake up. <laughs> so they're my life uh and uh thor is a he's a they found him in like a uh the first three months of his life must have been very very terrible he's mm -hmm. terrified to walk from the the door to the van but as soon as i get him in the woods he is big old smile on his face mm -hmm. and his favorite thing to do is chase me on a bike so it just works out that for him to go to bathroom, I have to drive to the woods and now I have a bike rack. So we go, we ride every day and every day we're home, we're riding today. It's starting to get colder. So we're layering up and stuff and they'll, they'll come a time at the end of November where we have to kind of hang it up. Um, but that's probably when I'll be, uh, thinking about going down South. Maybe down south. Yeah. we'll see. And if anything else comes up, uh, anybody need a shooter out there? Let me know. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, with what, uh, happened here also in the state of Maine, if you folks, if you could just have those families and, and people, um, and your thoughts and prayers, uh, that would mean a lot to me because it yeah. was, uh, it wasn't very far from uh, you, right? No, about a 40 minute drive, 30, okay. 40 minute drive. Um, uh, I was involved with it a little bit as far as, um, uh, this search part, um, in the very early stages, uh, the perpetrator did off himself in the end, um, giving those families closure. Uh, it's, it kind of, you know, it, it sucks because these things happen all the time, but it, it. So, you know, uh, with what's going on in the world right now, it's kind of gotten brushed under the rug a little, I think, but just to, just to have them in, in your thoughts and prayers, because this is, this Maine might as well be a big town just with a lot of land. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it very much feels like that. And these, those, I guarantee you everyone in that um, well, I know everyone in that community knew that individual, that individual knew everyone in that community. Um, and, uh, it was just terrible. Yeah. So if, if, uh, yeah, if people could just think about them and just all this shit in the world, man. I mean, we're, again, we're so lucky we get to jump on a bike and kind of forget about it for a little bit, but it's, it's, it's scary out there, man. Yeah. It's super scary. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Be 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 grateful to have two wheels under you if if you are uh fortunate enough to have a bike and be able to ride. Uh don't take that for granted. And um Ben, I love you. I'll ride with you soon. <laughs> Stop complaining. Um Nico, I think you have built something that in the beginning I was so excited because I just knew where it was going to go. The writing was on the wall. Um, you've created definitely one of the most prominent race series in the U S I think the prom most prominent and most well done. Um, and that's including GRTs and stuff like that. Um, close, close second would be clay and the U S open. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, that race means a lot, so much to us. Um, uh and yeah i just uh more usdh and uh yeah more kids on bikes more hmm. girls on bikes we need to get these gals on bikes because when they go overseas i don't know what happens but they turn a gear on and just watch out for uh lily and abby ronka because they're they're fighting for they're it too it, huh? so yeah it's awesome yeah it's it's so cool to see and just be a part of them i'm so grateful Cool. So so grateful. I hope you have enough pictures to uh, cover this whole. Uh... Yeah, they will. We might we might show our mugs a little bit. Hey, oh, Nick. Nick sent three questions, but one oh, of them no. is: What are your favorite things to do at home that are not bike or photo related? 
Now, oh, I, I know God some of the answer damn. to this, but it, you don't have to share that yeah. if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So I, I started sickest. doing just, it's just um, painting miniatures. So that game, Warhammer, it's like, I got one right here. So it's just this little dude, right? And you can play this board game with it. It's so hard. It's like 3D chess, 3D chess on crack. Like it's <laughs> the the rules are ridiculous. But my favorite thing is to that's not bike related is to put these little things together, paint them up, try to make them look realistic. It's super corny and I'm embarrassed of it, but no way, don't that, be. that's it. Like I said, man, I'm an open book and I have to be to be able to do and operate the way I I do. I have to be accountable and it's okay to have a, a nerdy thing to do to, to take your mind off stuff for a while and, and not play Call of Duty or whatever to, yeah. to eat up your time. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nick, for shouting that out. <laughs> awesome. But um, yeah, Nick, George uh rachel lars you um nico dakota crispy there's i mean i love i love my life i love my i love the people in my life frida i don't know if i said her uh yeah just yeah we should probably do another one of these if we can because there's a lot of people that need credit where credit's due okay and and yeah i'm down so, awesome cool, man. thanks jack appreciate it thanks thanks for being you, Sean. so open and so candid so yeah my pleasure boss man ain't no thanks peace